like get a fresh copy. We don't really care. Like it's not a true way interaction. Sorry. So our second goal, it's a bit, a bit harder than that. We are not really gonna just clone something to have it. We're gonna actually do a two way interaction, which is a more involved process and requires a bit workflow. Again, let's go to the terminal. So here we have, for example, a tutorial project that you're all gonna do. And we have a repository for that tutorial. The first thing that you have to do is what we are no longer going to be cloning. We are actually going to be forking. Um, if you can see my mouse here, I'm at the fork button here. Let me make this bigger. Okay, so it's slightly, slightly bigger now. But if you click on the fork button here, as you can see, I, here I'm on the Ocean Hack Week organization. And I'm going to bring this to my personal account, right? But it takes a while for GitHub to do the forking because it's pretty much copying that repository into my account. And now, as you can see, I have my own version of that repository and it says fork it from here. Now I can clone it. And take a step back here. But as you can see, I'm cloning from my user space. Let me enter that directory. For those who have Git configured on your uh, laptops, you're gonna see this here, which means I'm on the master branch, um, which by the way, Git is renaming to make it better. It's probably gonna be the main branch pretty soon because this has terrible connections to slavery. We had master and slavery. And thank God Git is finally fixing that for us. But the default is still master branch. And if we do git remote slash v, which means verbose, we can see all the connections that I have from this repository to something online. And the only connection I have is on my own personal fork. However, to actually work on the project, I need it to connect it to the upstream repository, to the one I forked. So I'm also gonna copy it here. And I'm gonna do git add upstream, oops, sorry, git remote add upstream. I apologize for the copy and paste. So git remote add upstream, I'm gonna add the origin of all this where I forked. And you see how the names can be confusing? I just said the origin, but git tells me origin is mine. And you're hearing car crying right now. That's uh, probably me because of the mistake I just made. So now you can see when I do the Git remote, you see my origin and you see my upstream. What does this mean? This means that if I edit something here, and I'm gonna edit right now. So this is a dummy project and this will be deleted after the tutorial. And let's say I gave up this idea um, and I say, I'm keeping this. So I changed the readme file, right? With git status, I can see that I modified this. And now how do I push gins back to the upstream repository? So my workflow here involves that I need to create a branch and I can do git branch and I have to name a branch and I'm gonna say work in progress, in progress. Now I can enter that branch. So as you can see, I switched it from master to that branch. And when I switched it, it told me that the readme was modified. I can check the modifications. I mean, I just did it, but imagine if I'm doing a lot of changes and I need to check and I can do a git diff and it says that I deleted this and I added this. And now the last step is to actually commit my changes. So I'm gonna 
commit with a message saying, I decided to keep this directory repository. Okay, so let's just recap. I forked the project and then I create a branch for my work. Then I committed my work. The next step would be submitting this back. And to submit this back, we use git push. And in this case, I'm pushing to upstream from my origin, the work in progress. If you're confused about all this, join the club. Git is annoying and it's hard. So for those who are familiar with the, this workflow, this is something familiar for those who never see this before. I'm just trying to show you what you probably face throughout the week. So you can actually know where to ask questions. We don't want you to just start on your own and start doing this right now. So let me push it. And Git is nice enough to hear on the message, tell me that if I go to this URL, I can start a pull request to that project. So I just click it here. It's comparing the changes between my changes and the changes that leaves upstream. I can see the changes here as well, like same thing, deleted this and added this. And I can leave a message. And I'm gonna leave a message to Joseph. I know his GitHub handle and say, hey, can you review this please? And I'm gonna create a pull request by clicking on this button. And there you go. By the way, um, when I'm sharing the screen and I can see anyone and you can't speak to me, it seems like I'm screaming to the void. So if you ask questions on Slack and if our helpers are monitoring Slack and you wanna voice any questions, that's the moment because we're gonna be waiting for Joseph's uh, review. June, Kevin, is anyone on Slack? Yes. Cool. And Joseph, yeah, I'm waiting too. for your reveal, by the way. Actually, maybe I should have asked Ujung for the reveal. Joseph has his hands busy. Let's okay, say, I can do that. Yes. All oh, right, I didn't make Joseph an official reviewer. He just told me that because we have this here where I can ask, actually ask people directly to be an official reviewer. But for some reason, I can't make him a reviewer here, probably because he's not listed as well. But I think I can make Wujung. Yes, there we go. The difference between doing here and here is not that important, right? Here is just a way of GitHub asking me officially, hey, can you be a reviewer? And here I'm just pinging people because I can pretty much ping anyone here that I have a GitHub handle. GitHub interface is nice enough to tell me who is participating in the conversation so far as well. So Jung, I, make, I made you a reviewer and I'm gonna make your job easier. You can see that you don't agree and close the PR. So we can show them how to close a, a PR. You wanna share your screen to do that? Uh, that's why I can uh, maybe reply and then you'll show up on your thing. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so would you actually ask me to follow up? Can you add one more line? I said, sure. Let's do that. 
So I'm editing the file a little bit more and saying um, this is your extra line or this is the extra line you asked for. Bear in mind that we're actually going to be doing this with code, which is way, way more complicated <laughs> than this. I, I love to scare people off. So I, I'm writing a new commit message when I say that, that this is a junk review comment. And I'm going to push it again. Look that now that I connected this branch to that PR, I don't need to do the setup stream again. I can just do push and it knows what to do. If you remember the first time I actually did this, right? If I, if I do that again, it's not a big deal, but I don't have to type everything again when I'm working on the same branch. And now as you can see, my extra commit showed up here. If you go here on the interface, you can see all the individual commits and you can see all the changes. And you can see the changes based on the commit. Like this was the first one where I just added this line. And this is the second one where I added the extra stuff that Lujung said. Usually it's polite to re-request the review. So because Lujung made her review, I can just click here and ask again, or I can just ping her like, So as you can see, the GitHub PR, it's a conversation. When you open a PR, you're not really open, please take my changes because I need those changes on your project. You're opening a conversation. I'm proposing this change. Let's talk about it. So the PR can be either merged or closed, but whatever result is within this interaction here. So let's wait for a joint second look. And then I'm actually gonna show you this workflow again but with a focus, with an objective, which is to close an issue, for example. So yeah, we don't just merge it. Uh, there, there's some housekeeping that we can do. I can delete the branch. This is not that too important. Oops. This is just a bug on the GitHub interface. Or did you reopen it, we do See, yeah, I messed up. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Wujun merge and reopened it by accident, which is fine. So, which is normal, by the way. It's a good, she did it on purpose. Oh yeah, it's very normal because the button is right there. So if you click twice by accident, that happens. So yeah, that's gonna happen to you all. So now, if I go here on the issue part of the project, I have an issue that I open, which is of course a fake issue, and I ask Joseph and say, let's create this fake issue to demonstrate a fork branch workflow. And we need to add a readme. So the readme is there already actually, but we need to do the name of the project and add, add the participants. So how can I do that? First thing first, now that this PR was merged, I have to get rid of this branch. So I have to go back to the master branch or to my main in the future. And I can fetch all the changes for upstream. So now I got the changes for upstream, sorry. I have to merge those upstream changes back into my project. And now as you can see, I have changes to submit back, but this is only for my origins, oh, sorry. So I'm syncing the upstream with my origin. So now, the original dummy project and the one that lives on my own fork, they're in sync, they're this one and the same. So I can do extra work. Again, all these comments, I'm gonna send them to you in a, a sheet sheet so you can take a look. But we really hope that each project, you're gonna have at least one hit expert with you to help throughout this. We definitely don't expect all of you to be doing this. And this is gonna be clear in a moment. So let me create a new branch and I'm gonna create this branch with the name um, issue one because I'm gonna address the issue one. Let me change that branch. And if we 
if I remember correctly, we need to name the project and add a participant list, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. By the way, I'm opening the README with VI, but you can open with any text editor that you have, right? Here I'm using VS Code, and this is probably too small for you to read, but I'm gonna give you a proper name. Um, as you can see, my imagination is very limited, a proper name. And instead of all this, we're gonna have a list of participants. And on that list, I'll have myself, Joseph, and Emilio. Okay. You can ask for each participants to add themselves, or you can assign a person to add everybody. I'm gonna close this. Now again, we can check the status. It says that the reason is modified. I can do the diff to be sure that the changes that I want are there, and there they are. And now I can do the commit. And again, with a message, uh, this closes issue one. There is a bit of magic when I use this uh, kind of text because GitHub now knows that I'm working on issue one. And if this PR is accepted, issue one will be automatically closed. That's not too big of a deal because you can always put that here as well on the message like I'm gonna be doing here, this fixes one. And it makes a cross reference to the issue. I'm gonna create a pull request. Ask for a review. Again, I'm gonna ask for Ujung's review. And while we're doing this reviewing, I can show the same thing. We have the commits, we have the changes. Here on the changes, if I remember correctly, because this is a markdown file, we can have the raw changes or we can have um, reach difference, uh, which is a render markdown. Depending on your project, this can be very handy because you can see the easier some changes, like it, it's more important. For example, this is a heading, this is a second heading. If you look at the raw text, you see a hash and two hashes. You don't see those are, as heading, you don't see those as rendered. So Jung, I'm ready for your review. Any time now? And now that Jung made the review, Let's see what happened to issue one. So issue one was closed when she merged that, right? Because she solved it by merging this. Okay, so let me get back to my slides. We're done with the terminal. And I just want to show you this tweet because if you're very confused right now, it's fine, right? If it makes you feel any better, nobody actually knows how to use Git. You just memorize a few shell commands and hope nothing implodes. Again, on the first model where there is one-way interaction, if anything implodes, remove the directory, clone again. On the second one, ask an expert. And you definitely have at least one expert in every project. If it's not the mentor, one of your colleagues. I also want to put these links out here. Uh, if you're a novice, please, please, please do the software carp tree um, tutorial on Git. It's pretty good. It's this web page right here. You can do this over this weekend if you want. And I also wanted to show you oh, when I see this presentation mode, it doesn't get to the slide where I was. This one, this is also a nice resource which is a complete workflow and pipeline for a Git GitHub project using R. So if you're an R person, you might be interested in look at this one. Like, these are all the steps on how, why you do this, how to configure, how to create a branch and all that stuff. Like, those demonstrated with more specific stuff for R. By the way, um, why we do this is a good question. I'm not sure if someone asked that. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the questions uh, 
uh, very soon. You, you, I was going to ask you exactly that. If you get it so awful, why are we doing it? Yes, thank you for that. Like I paid him <laughs> to ask that question. I owe you a beer. Kids is the necessary evil. Uh, we need to track files. We need to track our work. We need to track uh, code in a way that we can roll back changes if they don't work. In a way that we can do small chunks of work that are meaningful to a big project, right? You can use Git to write a paper. Can you Git to manage a project? You can use Git for code. We usually use Git for code. And like I said, we are gonna have music at the end and you all can sing along. This is the Git Poema Rhapsody. If you understand this side, you're a Git expert. So I'm gonna let you all sing this and I'm gonna stop sharing um, and go to Slack to see if we have any questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any questions, folks. We do. There. Or there is one. Do you, uh, if you scroll up onto that panel. Okay. What does upstream mean, right? Yep. Yeah, and what's different from a regular Git push? Okay. So um, upstream mean well, the origin of the upstream are just names. I could have different names, right? But we use the defaults to avoid confusion when you're reading a document or a tutorial. Origin is my copy. Upstream is where I copied from. So I copied from the Ocean Hack Week project into Philippi project. So when I do the push upstream, I'm trying to push it to the Ocean Hack Week project. I'm trying to get my changes and ask for them to accept my changes. And what's different from a regular push is that if I did a regular push within that configuration, Git would ask me, oh, where do you wanna push this? Do you wanna push to your origin or to your upstream? And this can get very confusing very quickly because you can have multiple upstreams and multiple origins as well. Please never do that. Just keep things simple. Keep your fork and one upstream. Just because it's possible doesn't mean you have to do it. I added a link um, to uh, on the uh, Slack channel um, for a great uh, article on the workflow that Felipe explained. And I also pulled out or highlighted a link to a figure that is um, that represents us three elements of the triangle we've been talking about, your clone, your fork, and the um, original repository, not origin, the upstream. Uh, so hopefully that'll be of use to some people. Um, I'll take no credit for finding that article. Actually, Felipe found it, but I'll take the credit for remembering it. It's a, oh, you it's definitely need the credit for that because I was looking for it to put on my slides and now I just did, by the way, thank you. <laughs> so everybody have it, yeah. But I really um, recommend that if you wanna um, uh, enrich what you um, got from Felipe. It's very well written. So I'm gonna share these slides with you all pretty soon. I'm gonna share all those commands and comments on what they mean. You can ask questions on Slack after this tutorial is done. I did reserve a port to do a hands-on, but I don't think we, we have the hub yet. And we're gonna have to do this with everybody anyway during the first day. So this is optional, but the part where we plan the tutorial is not optional, everybody will have to do it. So we're not gonna do that today. We're gonna do that on Monday, all right? Is that fine? And I'll I'll also to ask questions to the void. <laughs> There's another question popping up. And before we answer, I'll just add that um, this is being recorded. The tutorial is being recorded, um, video and audio, obviously. Um, we will post the video to YouTube um, probably by tonight, definitely by tomorrow. Um, and that'll be the same for all tutorials. Uh, but especially given that this is optional, if you felt that you didn't catch everything and you'd like to review it, the, his materials will be available and the video will be on YouTube. And of course, we'll let you know if you have the uh, announcement channel on Slack. So I've got a really nice question there. That's very important and I forgot to mention. Uh, the person asked, do you use multiple branches at the same time? If so, in what way? So branches are a context, right? 
for example, on the first branch, I called work in progress. I could have started the second branch at the same time, which was the context was close issue one. And as we work on different contexts, you can open multiple branches. Suppose I have a code project and I want to fix a bug. I can open a branch, bug fix X. Or if I want to add a new name to the project, I can, do, can create a branch, uh, creating a new name for and all that. So I can have multiple branches and multiple PRs, but keep the context small. The smallest PR that you can do, the smaller context that you can do, it's better. Like bite size uh, stuff, it's easier to reveal. If you do a huge PR with a lot of different contexts on the same uh, commit, it will be very, very hard for the person reviewing it on the other side. This is my personal experience as an open source developer. I got PRs with changes like that, that the change in the feature added was awesome, but I had to refuse just because I could not review it, just because they were gigantic. So do small branches with small context, with small commits at a time. And I'll add to that, I mean, it's probably directly related, but that uh, if you work on a branch for a long time, even if it's not a ton of work, um, but it's over a long time, um, it, the likelihood that there, you, there will be um, conflicts when trying to merge or just increase. Um, so then it's it, natural to think of, uh, this branch is my project, it'll take me two months. Um, typically that, that becomes a problem for yourself and the person who's reviewing this. The shortest amount of time that the branch can leave with the smallest contents, the better. Any other question? Uh, yeah, there's another one. Uh, if we push upstream, do we also need to worry about keeping the origin up to date? Yes, we do. That's what I did with the work in progress branch, but I did not do with the issue. Let me um, share my screen again and do that. So I still have my issue branch here, right? So I move back to master. And I fetch upstream, git fetch upstream. The minus p here is just to prune any branches, but you don't need that. So git fetch upstream, it's fetching the changes. It told me that it fetched the changes here on upstream master, but I also want them on my origin, right? So I have to do a merge. So I'm merging my upstream ma master here. And now I have that change. If I do a git log, you're gonna see that this is the change, right? Pull request three that closed issue one. Before I push, let me show you what I have there. So this is the main project, right? Where now it has a proper readme with a list of names. Let me go to my fork. So if I go here, I type my git username, I'm on my fork. My fork still has the old one, right? So if I come here and I push it, now I'm pushing to my origin because I didn't say anything specifically about an upstream. If I refresh this page, now I have it in sync with upstream. So now my fork and the upstream project are again in sync. Always keep your stuff in sync, right? Um, one question that I don't know if people have is, do I always need the fork branch PR workflow for my projects? Not necessarily, no. If you're working on open source with multiple people, yes, that's preferred. If you're working with just yourself, you could work directly on the upstream, let's say. Or if you're working within a smaller group, you can also do that. However, at some point when you have more than three people contributing to a project, the fork branch PR uh, workflow is definitely worth it. Even though it's complex, it will save your work on the long run. Let's see if we have any other questions. While you're looking for the questions, uh, uh, remembering that uh, um, when you uh, talked about uh, the reason why we use this awful system, um, the advantages, I think uh, Felipe highlighted the advantages of get. Uh, in other words, the, um, uh, the importance of uh, versioning the files and keeping track and that sort of thing. 
but I, I, I'm sorry, Felipe, if you mentioned this and missed it, but I, I don't think you emphasized the value of GitHub uh, in the enabling yeah. that conversation. Um, so, and that's complementary to Git itself, um, that uh, in addition to all the awfulness of, of the technical aspects of Git, um, GitHub is your, and sorry if this will be awful, an awful analogy, your <laughs> Facebook or your, uh, not quite an Instagram, I guess, for code and for these conversations because it enables in a natural and in interconnected way um, communication, ongoing communication and conversation and record of that conversation uh, and decisions um, that are open. Um, and that's a sometimes undervalued aspect of uh, why we do this, why we use these awful systems. Yeah, it is undervalued and you're right, like Git is terrible, GitHub is okay. And it is kind of a social network. And this goes towards uh, the next question that I have here said that you, you move back and forth between the command line and the web interface. Are there any particular things we should avoid doing through the web interface or vice versa? So yeah, I could do, for example, the PR um, or more, or sorry, I could close uh, my branch and all this via the command line interface, but I didn't do that, right? And no, uh, there is nothing that you shouldn't do on one on another, but you can definitely do more on the web interface. And I'm gonna show how you can set up PR on the web interface right now, because you may end up doing this yourself. So here I'm at the main um, repository. I'm again going to switch to my fork. And as you can see, if I go here on the file and I click on this edit button, I can edit here. And now, oh my God, I forgot Wujong. Let me add her here. And I can pick the commit message here, like the same way I did during the command line. Adding Wujong. I can have an extended description, but I'm lazy, I'm not gonna do that. And instead of committing directly to the master branch, I can create a branch here as well. So all those things that I did on command line, I can, I can do here. I can name this branch add propose the changes. And now it opened the PR interface and I said, hey, um, oh, it opened the PR on my fork. Yeah. Master branch. Yeah, it opened a PR on my fork, but I can say anyway, uh, hey, I forgot. I'm creating a pull request. The only problem is that I send a pull request to myself in this case, but it's no big deal because if I can merge this, I can show you now that I'm out of sync with upstream. Like I have Wujung here and upstream doesn't have. So I should also send this to upstream. And one way to do that, it's to create a pull request to upstream here. I could do, do that, that before, but I forgot to change this part here. I want to, uh, oh, a lot of people red clone this. Like I can send it anywhere pretty much. Um, you see, I also get confused with all this. Maybe the easiest way is for me to come here. Uh, okay, I'm crashing and burning like I was hoping that would happen. Let me try again. No more fork. I'm gonna do a pull request. The changes are here. Create a pull request. Ah, now we go. Add junk. As you can see, I don't use the web interface a lot. And there you go. I created a PR with a commit message and everything from within the web interface. Um, just to answer that question properly, is there something that you should and should not do? Uh, no, you have to do whatever you're most comfortable with. 
and that's my answer to pretty much everything in code, text editor, um, whatever. Do we have another question? Um, aha, this is a very good one. What's the most common mistakes we should be mindful uh, when we're getting started? Uh, this is the ones that I know, but there are websites with better lists. Making big PRs, forgetting to do the fork and, and the branch model, fork branch PR model. Um, what else can I say here? Uh, changing the context in the middle of a PR, like you open a PR to close issue X, and then in the middle we decide to fix issue Y as well. That's usually frowned upon. I mean, even if it may be easy for you to do both in the same PR, but it's gonna be hard for the reviewer, right? Uh, Emilio, do you have anything to add or any, anyone else with more Git experience as well to add on common mistakes? Others should talk and chime in, but uh, um, uh, this looks like a great uh, repo to me. Um, uh, are, are you sure there aren't any new issues that uh, other people may have opened? Oh, let me check. Let me share my screen again. Aha, someone just opened an issue. And it's just coincident that this person was Emilio. So this is a great project. It does exactly what I need to finish my PhD. <clears throat> and I've been working on something similar. How can I contribute? Oh, please create a fork. Add or work on a branch with the context of your problem and send PRs. By the way, what nobody asked, what does PR mean? We keep saying these terms and we forget that people are new to this. PRs means pull requests, which means that he is gonna create changes and request me to pull those changes in the project. So this question that Emilio just asked me here, if you have a big open source project, you actually have a file with instructions on how to contribute. GitHub even have a nice interface where you can create a file that's called contributing.md that will load automatically when everybody opens a PR with the rules of the game. Because when you're doing code, people, some people like tabs, some people like spaces for indentation, right? So you have to put those rules of the game in there on the contributing file, or this is mostly a Python project. So if you're not a Python programmer, you can take a look at this tutorial. This can also be in there. Uh, you can react with emojis, by the way, Emilio just had his reaction here. And I'm gonna add mine. Emilio, I'm not sure, do you wanna send a PR from your side? So I can show here how it's gonna show up on my side or are we done? I don't know, whatever. Let's send the PR so you can add your name so people can, can understand how okay. it's gonna happen on your side. So what Emilio's so. gonna do right now, he's gonna fork this, he's gonna create a working branch and add his name there. And why we do that, let me monitor Slack to see if we have more questions. So Ujung, I'm a little lost here on the slide. We don't have any new questions, right? There is a, so have you already talked about the conflict part? Like the, no, the first I, one I, partially I, about that. I haven't. And actually let's create a conflict while Emilio is editing this stuff on his side. I'm also gonna edit on my side just to create a conflict. Oops, let me pull my changes because I didn't do that. When I did my, when I did the web PR, I don't have the changes locally, right? So I need to pull the changes. 
And as you can see now, I do have all of you. And actually we already had the media, so I'm gonna remove him. As you can see, I forgot to create a branch. It's not a big deal. You can't create a branch after you commit it. There is a tiny difference that is gonna be clear later is that I already have that change on my master. But now, because I did that, uh, remove Emilio, and let me push this. Create a PR. So right now, Emilio probably has uh, a copy already that doesn't have this change. So I'm gonna be really bad and I'm gonna fast track this. I didn't put any comment and I'm gonna merge it myself, which is something that you should never do. You should always ask for a review. And because I did this very fast, that means that now Emilio doesn't have this change and he didn't see this change happening because nobody was called on a review. So when he sent his, he will have a conflict. Emily, do you wanna share your screen to show the conflict or do you wanna just send the PR anyway? So we can show the conflict on the web. Um, I just clicked on, um, I just sent the PR, so. Okay, so let's check his PR. And as you can see, he added Nick, but still has the old changes here, right? For some reason, this PR is still mergeable because he didn't add the exact same line. So we didn't create a conflict. We were not smart enough to create a conflict. I'm sorry, no we, we, no work, we work too well together. Ooh, I'm gonna create a conflict locally then. Okay, so I'm gonna fetch those changes. I'm gonna merge those changes. I'm gonna show you that I have this modified version and I'm gonna create a hard conflict, which is I'm gonna rename the readme file to something else. And again, I'm using my amazing imagination here on, with file names. So now I'm gonna merge a media change here. And now, as you can see, I have this change here, right? I'm gonna commit my change, which is, oops, sorry, hit commit and rename. I'm gonna push my changes. If I show you, I don't have the readme anymore, I just have something else, which means if I'm gonna fetch from upstream, and I try to merge, oops, you have a conflict. And in this case, it's a clean conflict. What does it mean that's a clean, clean conflict? It means that even though the history is diverged, I can re-add that file for you. So it's just telling you that that merge remove tracking branch on my upstream master. So it did that for me. Um, let's see, fetch upstream, merge, just so I don't forget all the steps, merge, and now I'm gonna push. So look at what happened on my fork now. My fork doesn't have the readme, but if I take a look at the history, Emilio's commit is right here on my history, right? So his change is here on my history. And my changes were put on top of that. So this is how we solve a conflict. 
I removed the file, but because it was a clean conflict, like just removal, I could get Emilio's commit and then get my change on top of that. What does that mean? It means that if I want to revert back to this, I can, like even if I never had this file, I can just get this specific hash, which is this weird number here, and I can get, like, I don't have it with me, but now I'm gonna get that specific hash, that specific part in history. And there we go, I have the readme. So let's say that removing the readme was a mistake and I really want this change. I'm gonna do something really, really uh, bad here. I'm gonna delete my master branch and I'm gonna create a new one. from that specific commit. And now I can force push it back. Oops. I told you that if you don't uh, type anything, it will just tell you what to do. When you're pushing, if you don't put the, the name of the branch. And then if I go back here, I restore that. And if you look at the history, my removal is no longer there. It's almost like if I just got Emilio's commit and I'm back in sync. Again, solving conflicts, either a clean conflict or uh, an ugly conflict where you actually have the same file edited by two different people, it's definitely not easy, right? So how do you avoid conflicts? Again, small PRs with small contacts. Um, any other questions? Someone that's not attending the Slack, do you have another question? We have, uh, so there are two, uh, three. So is there a command cheat sheet we can use for Git? Yes, and I'll definitely put that in these slides. Uh, I'm actually gonna put these commands that I use here and some extras. And there is um, the next question. When you say to send a PR, can, uh, in this example is what Emilio was doing. Can he not do it himself? Does it have to go through someone in charge? No, anyone can send a PR as long as you have a GitHub account. Let me share my screen again, just a second. Um, okay. screen. So as long as you find this repository online and you have a GitHub account, you can fork this and send a PR. Like GitHub is an open space for public projects. Of course, you're never gonna get a PR from someone that you don't know uh, on something like this. But if you have a big open source project, that can happen. Um, let me open one of my projects here, just so I can show you. Uh, actually, yeah, this one is fine. And if I, check here on the history. Um, all the PRs are closed because I tried to review them very quickly. And I'm gonna try to find those that are not open by me. Let me see. Oh man, I need a better community here. I'm pretty much doing all, all the work. Oh, this one. This was sent by this guy here from Rhode Island. So let me open his PR. And he found this project and he saw that I had a bad, uh, bad URL here, and he fixed the URL on my readme, right? So this is the kind of work that you do when you're co collaborating with others. I actually should have selected a few important PRs in the past. This one, for example, was sent by one that you're gonna, probably gonna meet to throughout the hack week, uh, Matt Biddle is one of our helpers. Um, by the way, I'm gonna call him on this, this is bad. Always leave a description, right? It makes the life of the reviewer easier. But his change was pretty easy. He just added the Biko demo server to the Discord server. So again, small chunks, small changes to make the reviewer life easier. Any other question? Uh, we have the last one. Um, 
what is the most common mistakes what uh, we should be mindful of when we are getting started? I think I answered that one, but we can talk about that, those again. Uh, so the if I go ahead and I'll say something after that. No, no, go go for it because I'm just going to repeat myself. I won't actually answer that question, but that's a reminder that uh, um, we will have well. Let's say that there's a 90% chance that we will have a separate uh, session uh, independent of this one on Tuesday after a, the uh, three hour block um, uh, from um, uh, another instructor. Um, specifically, what, he, uh, what the title of his presentation is the three most common mistakes or frustrations that scientists make with GAT. Um, it'll be brief, about half an hour, um, and we'll be sending details. Um, so if you feel you just haven't had enough of GET, um, uh, look out for this announcement on um, Tuesday after the 83-hour block. Yeah. And by the way, I'm asking a question here to test the Slido, and I want the attendees to answer that. Um, we, have a, we have a couple of new questions coming in. So who can approve a merge? Oh, that's a very good one. So let me show you again the repository, share screen. And I'm going to use this one, okay? So if you come here, you're going to see the contributors, right? And everybody that's added to the project can approve a PR. In this case, um, oh my God, I forgot. GitHub changed their interface earlier, by the way. That's why I'm completely lost on this new interface. So list of contributors, these are all the contributors. It doesn't mean that they have commit rights. To have commit rights, you need to add them to the team. And to add them to a team, you can be, oh, oh my God. I am completely lost here. It's oh, of course I'm lost because I don't have the rights to do this here on, on the iOS one. Uh -huh. Let me go back. So ocean high peak. Or, I apologize for that. Confusion and that back and forth. So let's open our dummy here. And okay. So I have commit rights, of course, because I just created it, right? And if I want to give someone, someone else the keys to the repository, make them the owner, I have to add them to the web interface, manage access. I have to return to my password. And now I can invite a team or invite an individual. Okay, so people will have access to this repository. Let's invite um, Ujung. And she's gonna get an email with the invitation. And now I can define a role as well. And of course, let's have the admin role. And I can remove people as well. So now both Hujung and I have what we call commit rights. We can both merge PRs and commit code to this repository. One good open source proxy is give commit rights to everybody. Because, because it's a tracking system, if someone does a mistake, we can revert. It's not a big deal. So be kind and trust that others will do the right thing. Any other question? We have your question. Oh yeah, but that's for the attendees. Yes. <laughs> okay, someone is asking a question about Slido. How do we see uh -huh. all the questions asked via Slido? I think you have to click here, view all and upload. And then the slide will open up our web interface. By the way, on our next session that we have later about Ask of Anything, you can uh, comment on all the systems that we are using. Like we're just driving slide, we're just driving Zoom, we're just driving all the things. So your feedback here is very important. But it just showed my question. How do I see all the questions? I think this is this might be that referring to so so um, the person who's moderating the questions have the power to mark questions as answered. 
So in this case, I mark those as answered as you uh, enter them. So I think that's why the number of questions actually keep on shrinking. Because I we, kind of, we can't see the answered question. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find how to do that. So I have an archive tab, but I don't think it's on the other one. Okay. So it's good to know, yeah, if a question is marked and answered, we can't really see them. I think we still see them here in a way. No, yeah, they disappear from here as well. No, I think it's only moderator can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good to know, maybe we should not remove them and mark them as answered. We should leave them there. Uh, it's a little hard to do. Well, it's more like because the Unless we always vote off the questions, you know, like Got new it, questions yeah. get buried in old ones. Here's what we can do, and, and please participants comment on this later. We can mark them as answered, but the moderator can copy and paste them later into the channel. So we have a history of all the questions asked. Does that make sense? Sounds good. And I'll also add that, uh, again, uh, Restating again that this is trial run. Thank you for your patience. Um, but uh, for the tutorials uh, next week, when we will have everyone, uh, we will have a more um, formal, if you will, uh, process for taking questions. We will have someone actively, one designated person actively monitoring the questions. And assuming you all are really engaged and ask lots of questions, uh, we will use Lido to let um, the most popular questions float up and decide which ones get answered first on that basis. Here, we're just answering all of them as they come in. Um, again, because it's a smaller group and um, we are trial running everything. So I, again, I reserved one hour for a live exercise that we're not gonna do, but we still have that time to, I don't know, Emilio, you wanna do um, some, announcements or something, or gonna let them go so they connect back again later for the icebreaker. You're muted. Bingo. I don't think I have anything. I had you muted on my bingo card. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, we can I think I'll, I'll we'll leave the uh, the session open since we have it and be more work to close it. And then um, six of us are scheduled to be here in about an hour to uh, for the ask us anything question uh, session. And that session is exactly the way it sounds. Uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have um, about um, today. Uh, or about tomorrow's session, or more likely about Ocean Hack Week in general. Um, you can ask about life, I guess, uh, um, but we'll defer, maybe. Um, yeah, so just, I, if you're interested, come in uh, in an hour. All right, thank you all for your does, attention. Does anyone else, I should ask that, do any of the other organizers have something you'd like to uh, say? Oh, Alex just ping me saying that he'll have a real PR on Erdapi in a moment if we want to show a live review. I would love that. So how long we do can you just and if you want to stay, um, this will be happening live. Yeah. I mean, you um, can all drop now, or you can wait to see a real review on a real call. <laughs> uh, but again, did, does anyone else uh, among the organizers want to say anything? And I just realized that if you do, I had to figure out how to how you can tell me so that I can unmute you. Um, so I have a, so Felipe, do you have, oh, hey, Stace, uh, do you have, uh, you know, some of the uh, repositories have this, you know, like when someone wants to submit an issue or submit a PR, they have a template. Do you have some that you can show? I think it's something good to show people. I'm going to show something else where I'm planning to add that, but I... I can definitely comment on, on how does that work. So um, again, share my screen. And Alex has the PR ready, so I'm also gonna share that pretty soon. So we have this skeleton 
uh, on IUs. By the way, I work for IUs, which means Integrated Ocean Observing System. More on that Monday during our data access tutorial. And this is not a real project. This is a skeleton that you can copy to start your project. This is a little bit complicated for those who never did a Python project before. So there is a few key files here that will do what Ujung mentions. The first key file we already had is the readme. The readme shows right here on the main page of the repository. Another file that uh, shows up like when you create a pull request, you can have a message pops up here. In this case, we don't have any message. One um, project that does that really well, and I've been meaning to copy it to our skeletons called NetPy, which if there are any meteorologists on the call, you probably know this project. If you don't, you're missing out. It's a really cool project. So you can have a code of, code of conduct file, a contributing file, and inside this special folder here, you can have an issue template and a pull request template. So within the special files, like it's pretty much a markdown file, which is just text that can be converted to HTML due to a special syntax. Like let's see the raw markdown. So this is a markdown table that's gonna show up here. So my internet works. Like this is the markdown file, this is the raw file. What does that mean? It means that if I'm gonna start an issue, a pull request, or any sort of contributing, those files will show up for me here. And let me show that. I'm gonna open a new issue. And as you can see, I have this selection. Is my issue a bug report, a feature request, or a report of security vulnerability? Let's say I'm opening a bug report. It's because of that file. And now I have this template. And they ask for stuff on the template, like try to have a code sample. So a minimal verifiable example where I can actually reproduce the bug that you're reporting and some information about the bug, like what version of MetaPy you are using, what version of Python you are using, what platform you're running on. So this is stuff that helps the life of the developer, either with the issues or the PRs, right? And it's just those special files. It's just markdown files that you put on your project. Okay. Um, does that answer the question? I'm not sure if that's your question, would you go someone else's? No, no, yeah, yeah, this is that. Okay. So now let's take a look at Alex's PR. So I'll go here and pull request. And I have it here, re-add the ability to pass request to the underlying uh, request library. So Alex Pierce, he mentioned, he has a nice description, had several tests to make sure the keyword argument can pass properly to request.cat. Request.cat is something that we do on Python to get information from a URL, including simulating and passing a timeout query to a slow proxy. Does not work on the remove request parameter as that may be mixing with the op. So this closes an issue. So he made a cross reference. So he's trying to close this issue here, which is an issue that I created when I pushed some changes that remove the feature that people were relying on. Um, one interesting thing here, so he just asked me to review, as this PR is special in the sense that this project has testing set up. The previous project didn't have testing. So the test is not passing. So even before I take a look at his changes, I can see what's going on. I'm gonna see this first test, which is called the pre-commit test. So let's see what happened here. So this test failed on the flake eight and on the I sort. Uh, this doesn't mean much to people who are non-Python programmers, but this is a coding standard test which means that the code per se is fine. It's just not formatted in the way that I expected. And I can configure that based on accepted standards. And the I sort is another standard for the sort of the imports on the file. Again, which means the code is fine. It's just not sorted in the way that I expect. And one may think, so why are we enforcing standards on the code? 
When the code base is small, it's not a big deal. But when the code base gets large, it's nice to have the standards to avoid changes that may confuse people later. Like if I'm just changing the order of the imports, you can make that confusing to people. So another test that was passed, that was failing, it was the actual code test. So I'm gonna open those here as well. There's this platform that you use to test, it's called Travis CI, and it's not passing the docs. So it's probably not Alex's fault that it's not passing, because it's probably my own fault. And the reason is, probably because Alex doesn't have access to the token to create the docs. So this is fine. Um, I actually just remind me that I should make this test uh, what, what we call a positive, um, sorry, um, false positive. So I don't bother to not merge the PR because of it. So Alex was really nice that he added a change log. So here's the change that he proposed. And here's the actual code. So he went there and in every URL request, he re-added the keyword argument that I removed, okay? So everywhere I have that, and then he creates a test, which usually when someone makes a change and create a test, that's only one comment for that. Really, if you get a test with your PR, you send the people hearts back, okay? It's mandatory. It's very important. Well, where's my emoji? Oh, it's actually hard and not love. That's very important. Every time you get a test with a PR, you have to do that. He actually gave me two tests. There's also a time out test. There is not much for me to comment here besides, hey, Alex. Thanks for the PR. Can you please, please address the pre commit failures? Don't bother with Travis CI failures. Those. Those are, oh my God, false positive. So I didn't have a lot to comment on the code per se because Alex is a code coder. I actually uh, threatened him with the keys of the repository if he ever sent a PR. So now that he sent a PR, I should give him the keys for this repository, which means he'll be a committer and an author. Also people who are interested in the project can comment as well. And when other users comment, I know that this is useful to others. So it's important for me to merge this as soon as possible. So others have access to this. And like I said, because I promised Alex to give him the keys while he fixed those things, I'm gonna give him the keys. Um, while he's doing that, I'll add that, uh, um, yes, it is wonderful and uh, deserves a, a heart uh, emoji when people submit tests. Um, I, th there are different cultures that revolve around different software packages and some cultures can, uh, um, well, this is totally personal opinion, may, um, it totally, again, my opinion, overemphasize that. Um, and um, it can act as a barrier. If you see language that says that you must have a test, tests are really important. But any engagement is contributes to a project, even if it's a bug report that you then follow um, with details about your situation and uh, support for a particular direction or improvement, that, that's, that's a contribution. And if you're yeah. contributing a PR that fixes something, or add something, yes, it would be great if you added a test, but don't let that be an obstacle um, because then what you're starting is a conversation. Um, and uh, the, 
person reviewing it may say, uh, yeah, this is fantastic, a test would really help, this is complex. And you may say, oh yeah, sorry, forgot, here it is. And then you get your heart um, emoji. Or you may say, like most people, I'm actually busy. I, I, I'm defending my PhD in a week. Um, so I can get back to this in two weeks or, or a month. And the reviewer will then decide, is this change important enough to uh, just accept it? Do I have time to write the test? Or do we just let it go that way and we'll, we'll work on a test later? It's yeah. these are thank, thank you for that. cultural choices, if you will. Thank you for that. It's very important to highlight that. Like when I said, if someone gives you a nice code with a nice test, give them love, but don't request that. Yeah, you can ask for people who are doing uh, this as a volunteers, right? The rules of engagement, of course, change from project to project. If you are in a company you working via GitHub, uh, there may be rules that PRs must always have a test. But here we're all scientists hacking at code. We're not coders working professionally with code. So do your best and be nice to others on GitHub. Like Emilio said, GitHub is a social network for coders. So be nice, like as you would be nice on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Sorry, I'll tweak also what you just said that I get have been a social network for coders. Again, it's not a, you may not view yourself as a coder. Um, I mean, other people may disagree with you and they view you as a coder, but even if you don't view yourself as a coder, it's the place of engagement of that social network with code, regardless of whether you're actually contributing a large chunk of code. If you're engaging with that code and what it does and how it behaves for you and what you expect, you, you are part of the, um, the community that gathers around that code. Um, and that's important. 